guest today is Martin Shoemaker. Martin, how you doing? Real good, Dave. Good to see you again. Good to see you. Um, you know, I knew of you before I knew you. I knew that uh, I knew of you as, as the UML guy. You run the website UML.com. UML UML guy. UML.com. UML.com. Your UML guy on Twitter. Is it true your license plate says UML My license, guy? The license plate came first, actually, and then it sort of surrendered to the brand. The, <laughs> that was what people were knowing me as. I might as well turn it into a brand. You've written books on UML. You truly are the UML guy. Um, I think there's probably some people out there that deserve the title more than me, but around <laughs> here, they're not around to dispute it, so at least around here. <laughs> um, now, uh, a lot of developers are not using UML. In fact, I would go so far as to say that most developers are not using UML. And I think most of them would say they're doing just fine without it. Um, why should they care? Um, well, I'm a big believer in if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Okay. So if they really are doing just fine without it, there is no reason why they should feel compelled. However. There's also the, if I don't know it and don't use it and somebody else does, maybe they've got an advantage I don't have. Okay. So sometimes you're not broke, but the other guy's less broke. And therefore, you're broke because he's making all the money. Well, I think there's a lot of uh, people who don't know what they're missing. They're mm -hmm. just not aware of They're not educated about UML. So why don't you educate What is UML, first of all? What is that well, word? some of them are, are even standpoint. worse miseducated. Okay. That, that their idea of UML is different from what UML really is. Because going back, back to what it is, what it stands for, I'm going to say the name backwards because that's where I put the importance. Language Models Unified. First and foremost, the unified modeling language is a language. It is a communications mechanism. It's a language expressed not in words, but in pictures, right? Pictures with some words. Obviously, you've got to put some labels on things unless you're an incredibly imaginative artist with it. You've got to put some labels on that this stick figure represents the bank teller versus this other stick figure, which is the bank uh, accountant, this other, which is the, uh, the customer, and so on. A okay. little bit of words, but it's largely pictorial, it's largely graphical. We have plenty of graphical languages in our lives. Um, we've got flow charting, which is sort of an antecedent to UML, and UML has encompassed the flow charting concept. We've got Gantt charts. Gantt charts are a language for expressing schedules in a graphical fashion. We've got graphs in general. We've got uh, musical notation. If you try to take a musical score and express it in words, I know people who say it can't be done. I'm going to disagree. I'm going to say it can't be effectively done. Sure. But you can certainly write down the note and duration to be played into text. And it would be much more verbose. It would be much more verbose and not capture anything useful. It's too verbose. Okay. And yet, if you take and translate that same music into, say, a MIDI score or a WAV file, those are really nothing but long strings of numbers. Mm -hmm. So they're the equivalent of translating it into text, but they're translating it into numbers that a particular tool knows how to interpret. Okay. For the human being, not being a computer, we translated those into note pictures right. on a scale picture with timing pictures and we've created a graphical notation for sound. Okay, and that's now just to what UML is, which is a graphical notation for software development. I'm going to go and, and disagree there because I'm cantankerous. Okay. I have decided long ago that I'm going to push the message UML is not about software development. Okay, that's news to me. What is it about? UML is about system development. Okay where a system is structure plus behavior plus purpose. And software is certainly a structure with behavior and we hope having a purpose. So that's just one system. That's one system. I use UML all the time for modeling businesses. A business is a structure with behavior of the people and the organizations within it and purposes that the business carries out. I've seen UML to model government organizations. I've seen UML to model how people are planning uh, screenplays and such. Hmm. Anything where you have structure, purpose, behavior, UML can be used for it to graphically present things in the problem that we're discussing and how they're related to each other. Or activities within the problem and what the rules are and the logic and the decisions we have to make and what the consequences are of particular decisions. Or larger structure, going back to business. 
that you have business units, you have different departments and so on. Those are structures within the larger organization. Okay. UML is a rich set of unified, there's where the U comes in, notations for capturing different views into a system. Now, it came out of the software world, that's why people see it as a software design tool, but honestly I feel that's part of what limits how it's being used. Hmm. You're telling me that you think most developers really aren't using UML. Well, would you agree with that statement? I unfortunately have to agree with that statement. I think it's a larger number than it was a couple of years ago. I'd like to think maybe I had some contribution to that in my little circle at least. Um, but since that's the circle I see, it seems like I've had a big contribution there. There's a lot more people using it. Yep. But still, when I go out in the industry, I don't see a lot of use of it. But then I go and start hanging out with business analysts. And some of these business analysts are using UML far more productively than the typical developer is. Because they're using it as a way to pictorially communicate with the customers about requirements and then take those pictures back to the developers and say, this is the behavior they're after. These are their business rules captured in structure and rules and interactions and so on. Uh, so that's a, I think that's probably the primary function of uh, UML. It's a communication mechanism and it's a communication mechanism that can bridge that gap that often exists between business users who understand their business and software developers who understand the tools that they're working with. Mm -hmm. And between customers. Um, this is something that when I started learning UML, I sort of took the gospel that was handed to me and said, that must be true. And then when I started practicing it more, I started to say, no, that's overly cautious. That was a statement that, well, these are great pictures, but you don't want to show them to their users because they're too complicated and it will just confuse them. Hmm. And I've come to the conclusion that too complicated is the big thing that's been stopping UML, and it doesn't have to be complicated. In the talk I just gave, I used a couple of metaphors for this. One is the Oxford English Dictionary. Mm -hmm. I think it's 20 million words in the English language. It's like 20 some, 22, 23 volumes of a dictionary. And the other is Microsoft Word, which will do just about anything you would ever want to do with written words. Right. If you called the English language the combination of Microsoft Word and the Oxford English Dictionary, the whole thing, and every feature in Word, then how many of us are actually speaking English? Well, we use a small percentage. We use a small percentage. Yeah. Small percentage. percentage of the features in Word as well. And that's where UML really should be for most people. When they see this big, complex, very rich and detailed notation, most people don't need 80 plus percent of that. They need a small core section. And that small core section I can often share with my customers without me even having to teach them UML. Okay. And this was the radical approach. I mean, the, I, I accepted the statement of, well, you can't share it with the customers, it'll be scary. And then I started with the, well, okay, but I'll teach them how to read it. And then pretty soon I was just showing them the pictures, realizing anybody you want as a customer can read a well-drawn UML diagram. The hard part is in the well-drawing. Right. Because you keep it simple, you keep it focused, you keep it in their language. It's in their problem domain. If they're banking, it's bank terms. If they're doctors, it's medical terms. Okay. So anybody can read that. The harder part is in the well drawing of it. But eventually I crossed this chasm and reached a point where I was drawing the pictures with them in the room helping me. And I wasn't teaching them the notation. I was essentially their UML tool. Hmm, okay. And I would listen to them respectfully, hear what they're saying, try to think about how would I draw a picture of this, and then when they feel like they've said what they mean, I draw a picture of it. Hmm. And they come back and say, no, you've got this part wrong, it doesn't go from this step to this step. I haven't taught them the notation, but I've kept it clear and clean enough that it's they're following. Them, yeah. And they're starting to correct me. Now they don't necessarily know what every arrow means, sometimes I have to stop and explain but I keep also to a relatively small amount of connectors and shapes, mm -hmm. and anybody can read it, and they start giving me feedback on it, and all of a sudden the productivity in these meetings starts to skyrocket, because we're essentially having two effects that I describe in my book, and have become sort of my hallmarks when I'm discussing this requirements gathering phase. The outline effect. You tell me something, and I make something with it. I don't just listen to you, I make something. It forces me to involve more parts of the brain. Okay. The, the motor sensors even for having to move the pen around, the cognitive parts that do the spatial relations, I have to involve more brain in it. Okay. And then I get the echo effect. 
I take that outline and I show it back to you and you say, no, that's not what I meant. I've taken an idea that you tried to put into my head and try to put it back into your head and by going through a whole different communications me medium, we have been able to eliminate all sorts of problems that can pop up in just verbal communication. It's funny, this really strikes a chord with me because this process of getting information from the customer, producing something, showing it to the customer, and getting feedback in a very short time, in these very rapid feedback cycles, that sounds like agile software development. That is agile yeah. software development. Even though you're not writing a line of code. And I'm just I'm using the same concept. It's really it's it's trying to get short, meaningful feedback loops. And this is where sometimes I have trouble convincing some agile practitioners that they're convinced that this must be done in working code. It's like it can be done in working code, but as fast as you can be on the keyboard, I can often draw a picture of my idea and get feedback back within the minute it took to have the conversation. Nobody codes back and gets feedback that quickly. Yeah. And so I can cut out a lot of those loops of, of feedback, cut them down to very short responses, very short cycles, by drawing the pictures and working out a lot of dumb ideas quickly. The classic example, of course, is you ask for apple, I think you mean computer, you think you mean fruit, Josh over there thinks you mean the, 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 uh, the record label, we're all hearing the same word, but we're interpreting it differently. These are, I mean, these are classic programming concepts. Right. Overloading and, um, I've lost the other one. But, but this concept. Polymorphism? Yeah, the, the <laughs> things, well, oh, things can have different names and a given name might apply to different things. Okay. This is not just a programming problem, it's a classic language problem. Sure. Overloading, synonyms. That's where that feedback comes in, mm -hmm. you know, to, to the, clarify that language. And when you feedback in a different form, mm -hmm. because if I just said back to you exactly the words you said to me, first of all, you already know it, but second of all, you're hearing no new content. Right. By putting it in a different form. Like a picture. Like a picture, or like working code. Mm -hmm. and, and this is why I say it's the same concept, just as you point out that it's the same closing up the loop, taking the echo, or taking the outline, turning it into an echo, realizing where we've missed sort of an impedance mismatch. Uh -huh. uh, now, so you and Al, you said that is, is big. I think I heard you uh, recommend that we should only be using a small part of it, simply for the purpose of keeping it simple. Mm -hmm. So tell me the parts that are most important. Uh, if I don't know anything about you and Al, where am I going to start? What am I going to learn? Uh, if you have certain books and tools sort of inclining you, you're going to start with class diagrams and you're going to not see the point because you're a programmer and you can write the code faster, you can draw that picture. All right, so are you saying class diagrams are not important? No, I'm saying that unfortunately they're a lousy place to start in oh, general. Okay. So where's a good place to start? Where I like people start is with use case diagrams. Mm -hmm. A use case diagram is an actor, some person or thing wants something from your system and you build a picture of the list of things that actor wants, okay. and then you start adding context to that picture. Who has to participate to help it happen? Who has to be notified about it? Who has to acknowledge it and approve it? And also, what information is created? What information is read? So you start adding in this context. Okay. But where I would honestly, since I'm assuming your audience is programmer heavy, yeah. where I would honestly tell your audience to start is probably sequence diagrams because I taught UML for a decade and I finally realized that you know sequence diagrams were the diagram that first made sense to me in UML maybe they're the ones I should be teaching programmers first they look more like code than any other they're UML. they're very code like they're very it's sort of an object call graph okay. and it's really I call it an object oriented flowchart mm -hmm. that you've got your objects across your t uh, across the top and you've got your flow of messages back and forth between them going down and it really does look like the code. Right. And so you start to say, I can make sense out of that. I can see some benefit out of that. If you were in an agile environment and you're sitting down, you're going to pair program to work on your story for this week or for this two week, whatever your interval is. If we sit down and first start drawing out that diagram and start with, these are the objects we already have. And then we're going to need to do this thing, which ob oh, no object does that. Do we need to build a new object, or do we need to add a responsibility to an existing object? Mm -hmm. You start drawing out this sketch of, here's what I think we're going to write in this code. When we agree on that sketch, 
through several iterations back and forth, pounding on each other, disagreeing, calling each other names, whatever. When we're at the end of that, we're both going to have a high degree of agreement of what code we're going to write. Right. And then, as the, the example I showed in the talk, we can start slicing that diagram up into the component pieces again and start defining unit tests for each of those pieces to say, so we've got two new calls into this piece, what are our tests for those calls? And all those calls are calling out to this piece, well, we're going to need a mock for, for that piece because we want to make sure we can control for the purpose of testing this piece what answers we're getting back. And so for every, well, for your leftmost swim lane, you don't have a mock that it's that's calling it, yeah, just and your rightmost you don't have any mocks it's calling. But you can essentially start thinking of I have to have mock objects for every lane in there, mm -hmm. and you build a, a TDD component for the other side. So if I've got a piece here, and I'm supposed to be called by the UI, and I'm supposed to talk to this database, I build a, a testing framework for the UI side, a bunch of TDD tests that are going to call me, and I build a mock to control what results I'm going to be getting, and presumably as part of your testing framework, you have something that hooks me up with the mock source to, of the data and so on. And so by taking that picture of what we intended to draw and slicing it up, we end up with a picture of what tests we want to build. So there's a lot of information that picture you've got. Uh, it's leading into the methods that you need to have, the objects those methods exist in, the tests, unit tests um, that uh, you need to consider, and even where the mocking needs to occur. Mm -hmm. And depending on how you're doing it, it can also write the code for you. No way. If, if you're doing it by hand, of okay. course, it's going. you're going to have to go write the code. Okay. But if you're doing it with a very wide range of good tools out there, as I draw that picture and I say, I need a new object here, I can write in that picture, say, and that object is going to be of this class. Mm -hmm. And then that method isn't just going to be just a random old thing called get balance. Mm -hmm. It's going to be a method with these parameters and with this return value. And then it's going to actually stick that method into the class. Mm -hmm. And at some point I can push a button and say, I want you to generate the code for this. Now it's not actually, of course, writing the, and here's how you calculate the tax percentage of this, that, the That's other. Right. The signatures of those but it's building the signatures. Yeah. And so it's given me a really great start. And this is why it was the diagram where I first started seeing real benefit because I could think through a problem and say, what I'm really lacking here is a, a tool that will tell me which destination I'm supposed to send this box to. So I need some sort of a dispatcher tool. So I'm going to make an iDispatcher interface. I'm going to have this method where I pass in a box label and it comes back out with a destination ID. Mm -hmm. And it proceeds to generate the shell, the, the signature for that interface. And then later on, I draw a picture and say, this class is going to implement that interface. And it says, well, then you need these methods. And I say, yeah, give me all of those methods. And I push a button, and there's the, the, the shell of the code. And well, I just have to go write the guts. Most of the good UML tools these days. Well, recommend some. Enterprise Architect from Spark Systems. Mm -hmm. um, I say this as a person who, although I haven't sold many of them, I write my own UML tool. But I haven't pushed a whole lot on it because I don't write tablet UML. It's specifically for tablet PCs, okay. which is a small market. And when Enterprise Architect came out at about the $200 range, it's got so much power at that range, at that price range, that I just have trouble seeing why anybody needs my tool unless they want the ease of drawing on a tablet, which is still some power I get right. from it. But Enterprise Architect is a very good one for this. Uh, the Rational tool set, much more expensive, but they've got a lot of capabilities built in on the process side that justify it for many people. And it also ties in well with a lot of stuff on the IBM side and the Eclipse side. Mm -hmm. So their tools will do this. A little more expensive. A little more expensive. Uh, Microsoft in T Visual Studio Team System 2010 is going to have some of these same capabilities out there. Okay. Uh, together from Borland has some of these capabilities. Most of the tools out there have some that, that are still competing out there have some degree of this code generation and reverse engineering. Mm -hmm. um, where Rational, I think, really shines is they have the concept of round tripping all the way around. Code generation and reverse engineering in a complete cycle. Mm -hmm. They do that, they've been doing that since long before there was a UML. They do that better than anybody. Okay. On the other hand, Enterprise Architect does it pretty well at a much lower cost. So it's a trade-off. You need to always have it be precise. I think Rational, at least the last time I looked, still beat Enterprise Architect. 
But what Rational would do, I mean, Rational, I want to, I like to say that in 1997, they stopped losing my code. They stopped losing your code. Right. Actually, it was, I guess it was closer to 98. Okay. That they had a release so they came is, up this, with. This is the danger when you generate code and then you modify or add to that generated code and then you regenerate the code. And it loses it overwrite what you changed. And they had some real good power for that, but somewhere around their 98, 99 time frame, they hit a version that it just never lost my code again. Okay. Enterprise Architect is really good and it never loses my code, but it sometimes gets lost. Not the code gets lost, the tool gets lost and, and it's like, you've made so many changes here that we don't know how to synchronize these two oh, parts up. Sure. So I'm not gonna lose your code, but we're gonna make new stuff and you're gonna have to go manually merge it. Okay, yeah, partial class is certainly must help with that a lot. Mm -hmm. But but for the price, I can live with that in general. But if you if you're in an environment that needs it absolutely perfect 100% of the time, unless they've somehow completely gone insane and thrown out all of their knowledge and expertise, Rational is still the best at that. Okay. Um, all right. Uh, well, I don't want to go too long on this. I know you got to drive to California tonight. Uh, just anything else you want to talk about about you and um, It's all about communication. It's all about the language. It is all about how we have richer conversations. Um, the pictures are a means to that. There's information behind the pictures in a good tool, but the pictures are a way we create these echoes, create these different ways of looking at things. Um, and the biggest thing that I find people have a hard time when it comes to adopting UML is the blank page. Sure. The, they don't know where to start, they don't know what to draw, they're afraid they're gonna draw it wrong. If they draw it wrong, it's going to make a mistake and they'll build the wrong thing and everything. And this is what I really wanna break people of this habit of thinking. It's not about drawing the right thing, it's about drawing the wrong thing and correcting it quickly. So the mistakes are part of the process. The mistakes they're are part of the process. Mistakes. And the idea that we can't draw it until it's right stymies a lot of teams and instead they'll go write some code. Mm, okay. And it's like, you know, when you're looking at the code, you've got a blank page, but it's a comfortable blank page. Uh, it's a comfortable blank page like, because we're developers, mm -hmm. because we're programmers. Uh, when we first started writing programs, that blank page was intended as well. Mm -hmm. So it's just the newness of it. And this is part of why I built the Ulterior Motive Lounge, is to, to shake people up and get them thinking about, this stuff is easy. I can do this. I can draw these pictures. I can, I can convey this what information. Is the Ulterior Motive Lounge? World's first and, to my knowledge, still only UML comic strip. Okay. <laughs> You're really wearing one on your chest. I am wearing one of my lounge, actually it's a lounge advertisement on my shirt. Okay. Um, it's a comic strip somewhat told in UML, somewhat about UML, somewhat case study oriented, somewhat really bad jokes about bad movies. Um, but I have really, really been absolutely stunned and pleased at people writing me and saying, I started reading this for the jokes. Well, first of all, I guess their taste in humor must not be that high <laughs> if, I'm, if my jokes are getting through them. But then they start asking me questions about UML. And they start telling me that they're seeing a benefit here now. They're seeing a reason why they would do this. They're seeing that, yeah, OK, this was a joke, this idea that we're going to tell the story of Back to the Future as a UML activity diagram. But they're still teaching. It's and they're still teaching. GBS. And they're looking at that and saying, why is it doing this? And wait a minute, I remember the movie. Aren't you missing a step? And they start giving me feedback <laughs> and showing that that I communicated something in this picture and they can communicate back. Uh, okay. And so hopefully that encourages them to just grab a pen and start drawing. Start drawing the picture of the structure or the behavior or whatever. Start drawing the sequence diagram to show how they're going to do work with the objects they have and what objects are missing. Okay. And that's just you can start get that doing from uh, ulteriormotivelounge.com. Okay. Yep. And also off the umlguy.com. Right. Uh, <laughs> what's the name of your book? Uh, UML Applied .net Perspective from A Press. A Press. Okay. And I am trying to work through my second one, requirements, patterns, and anti patterns for Addison Wesley. I owe them some feedback on some reviews. So they're not happy with me and. Mea culpa, it's all me. I've been in the middle of trying to get work, so I've been a little bit tied up. Well, good luck, and I really appreciate you taking the time to talk to us. I enjoyed your talk today at the uh, 
user group. All right, thank you. And thanks a lot. Good luck yeah. on your new job. Thanks.